Well, good morning. We're going to get started. I'd like to invite you to stand with us. If you're joining us online, would you please put your name in the comments? Let us know who's with us. We'd love to know that. And with that, let's sing. To God be the glory, great things he has done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son. Who yielded his life and atonement for sin And opened the life gates that all may go in Praise the Lord, praise the Lord Let the earth hear his voice Praise the Lord, praise the Lord Let the people rejoice Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory great things he has done oh perfect redemption the purchase of blood to every believer the promise of god the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from jesus a pardon Receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory. Great things he has done, great things he has taught us, great things. He has done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son. But purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear His voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he has done. us by the cross you came and broke them down you broke them down and there were chains around us by your grace we are no longer bound no longer bound you call me out of the grave you call me into the light you call my name and then my heart came alive your love is greater your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Feel the darkness shaking, all the dead are coming back to life. I'm back to life. Your love is greater, 
good. Amen. Was that amazing or what to start our Sunday this morning? Absolutely. I am Pastor Sandy. I am the children's pastor here at Linwood. And we are so excited to have you join us, whether you're in person or online today. If you are new to our family of families, we would love to hear from you. So you can actually go into our church center app, fill in our connection card, and that goes for anybody because you can put in your prayer request there. And I want you to know that as a staff, we pray over those prayer, prayer requests every single week. And so also online, just a reminder, if you can fill in where you're watching from and how many are watching with you, and I just want to start out just to pray for us this morning. We have schools that started last week. We have schools that are starting this week. Things in the media are getting kind of crazy right now with things that are being shared, and there's some anxiety that can come from that. But we have a God that is bigger than all of that. Amen? Amen. So let's go ahead. I'm going to pray for us right now. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for being bigger than any COVID, any fears, any sickness. God, you are our stronghold, and we can hold on to that. God, I pray over every child who enters into a school building, Lord, your hand of protection, every staff that enters, that includes everyone from the office to the teachers that are in the rooms, Lord, I just ask you for your hand of protection over them and peace. God, we love you. There are things that happen in this world, Lord, that are tough. They bring sadness. They bring fear. And God, I pray that you will just remind us that you are in the center. You are always present. And we can turn to you at any time. We love you. And in your precious and holy name,
you never stop working even when i don't see that you're working even when i don't feel that you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working but even when i don't see that you're working even when seated. starting a new sermon series this week but before we do I just got to say Michael you and your team you guys did a phenomenal job of leading us in worship today and I gotta say you guys sounded pretty good too I heard you come in on uh, 10,000 reasons and I heard the whole crowd singing behind me and I thought this place must have filled in and now I look up here and we've got two rows that don't have people in them and I'd say that's the first time we've been able to say that in several months. So I'm celebrating that as well and excited about that and excited to be worshiping with you and uh, to be kicking off uh, this new series. It's a series titled Weeping Well. And if you've been here the last five weeks in the Don't Be Dumb series, this might feel like a hard shift <laughs> where we went from a somewhat humorous and whimsical approach to some very serious subjects. Uh, to now uh, looking at a subject that's very important in our relationship with the Lord, in our experience of life. And what I have found is that if we do not learn to weep well, we will be angry when we don't necessarily know how else to express the emotion, or we'll drift into a place of emotionlessness where we are numb and we are unfeeling because we don't know what to do with the feelings that we have. And so however the, the weeping, the suffering, the grief may come to us, uh, what we do with that really matters. 
And there's a little bit of a play on words. If you look at it, it's not only learning how to weep well, to do it well, but there is a well that we access through our tears, a well of compassion from the Father of compassion, a well of peace from the God of all peace, a well of comfort from the God of all comfort. And it's available to us as we learn to weep well. And so we'll be looking at this. It may remind you at times of a sermon series we did last year, if you were part of the church back then, called All the Feels. And we had one message in that series on sorrow and suffering and and sadness. Um, But there were others because it was looking at the book of Psalms as a whole. Here we're going to be a little bit more focused. And if you don't like it, it's only three weeks long. So uh, you can you can you can do anything for three weeks. Right. Uh, And so I want to give credit where credit is due. I actually heard a message uh, from Tim Keller titled Praying Our Tears. And it was so good and so powerful and so timely uh, that I thought, well, one, Tim Keller might be able to preach that in one sermon. I'm going to need three. Um, And two, this is timely not only for me, but for uh, my church. And uh, so I'm excited to share it uh, with you. And in that series, he kind of explains something I hadn't really thought of before, that the Psalms provide a gospel third way to deal with our feelings. And that is through teaching us to pray our feelings. And I remember in the All the Feels series, I mentioned this idea that that most of the Bible is God talking to man, but the Psalms are man talking to God. And that the, the, the Psalms teach us, if we're willing to listen and to learn, they teach us ways to pray our feelings, whether those are feelings of joy and gratitude or feelings of sorrow, and frustration, even feelings of frustration with God. The Psalms model for us how we can pray our feelings. And when we say a gospel third way, we mean that, you know, there's the overly religious way that maybe is a little uncomfortable with feelings uh, because there's such an emphasis on devotion, even blind devotion on the far end of the continuum with religion that you just Don't feel, just do, just obey, just trust, just have faith. And it often denies the depth and power of feelings and emotions. And then the other end of the spectrum, the overly secular or overly emotional side would overemphasize feelings and elevate the emotions, bowing down to the emotions and following them around seeing discovery and expression of feelings as an end of itself. And so there are two extremes, and we're looking for a healthy way through the middle. And the Psalms teach us that healthier way. And so uh, we can still have fun in the Weeping Well uh, series, I would imagine. And, and so I've got a, a way of sort of illustrating the two ends of the continuum. Uh, maybe you've seen these Why My Toddler is Crying memes on, on Facebook. Um, <laughs> in this case, uh, the toddler is crying because he doesn't want the banana he wasn't offered. Have you ever had a toddler cry for not wanting something you didn't even offer? And when you explain, I didn't offer, I know, I don't want it. it So that's one end, you know, or uh, this poor little princess, her granola bar broke in half. I mean, that's a tough day. It was going to get broken into multiple pieces as she ate it, but right now that's just a lot to deal with. Um, Or, you know, this poor little guy, uh, the neighbor's dog isn't outside. I mean, what are you going to do? And so that's one end where we just over-identify with our feelings, but... There's another end that's not necessarily healthy, and I love this image that uh, repressed emotions made the evening pass without incident. Anybody grow up in a family like this or have experience in a workplace where unless everybody represses their emotions, the things do not pass without incident. And so you see the, the two ends of the spectrum, and neither of those is positive, neither of those is healthy. On the one end, we maximize our feelings and overdo them. On the other end, we minimize our feelings and underdo them. And maybe there's a way where we can right-size our emotions and our feelings and our response to them. 
And that's what we're looking for here, because both bowing down to and following around our emotions and repressing them or stuffing them away are dangerous and unhealthy. And God doesn't want his people to be dangerous and unhealthy as they walk through life. So he's shown us a way through the Psalms to pray our feelings. And interestingly enough, the book of Psalms can be broken down into a number of different types of Psalms or categories of Psalms. If you read a good study Bible, they'll break them down anywhere from six to ten different categories, depending on how, how tightly they, they apply a criteria. Um, and we looked at this really in the All the Feels series, that, that there are a number of different types of Psalms and different ways of expressing emotion. Things like laments, hymns of praise, hymns of thanks, hymns of celebration, hymns of wisdom or psalms that are wisdom psalms and on and on down the list. But one thing all the scholars agree on is that there are more psalms of lament than there are of any other kind. In fact, most scholars as they group them would put almost a third of the psalms into the category psalms of lament, that there are a lot of psalms of lament. And a lament is, design, is, is defined as a passionate expression of grief, of sadness, of sorrow. And if you don't know how to passionately express your grief and your sorrow to God in a healthy way where He can help you sort through your emotions, then you'll be more likely to passionately express anger or frustration or fear, or other negative emotions that come in and push the sorrow or the grief out. So that's why we're talking about this this week. That's why we're talking about learning to lament. I almost called the series that, but I really like the play on words with weeping well. And we're going to look at three different things to do with our grief or with our sorrow, three different things to do in the face of the, the inescapability of difficulties and sorrows and grief. And they are the three titles for the ser sermons in this series. First, to what we'll look at today, we expect, you expect your tears. Don't, don't fool yourself into thinking you're gonna get through life without sorrow and grief. Second, invest your tears, invest them. Do something productive with them. And third, pray them, pray your tears. And so we'll look at each of those subjects over the next three weeks. Today we're going to be talking about expecting your tears. And I can tell you, you can expect tears even if you're walking with the Lord, even if you are pursuing holiness, even if He's active in your life and you're reading your Bible and you're serving the poor and you're doing all the right things, you can still expect tears. You don't just get a free pass because you're being a good little boy or girl unfortunately. And Christians have this myth that goes something like this. If I'm good, God won't let anything really bad happen to me, right? Or we take that to one extreme and we power up with faith, like, like if we just have more faith. If, I remember when I was a pastor in Casper, Wyoming, uh, one of my friends, his son was born with a congenital heart defect. And, and he was asking himself, did I we prayed for a healthy child. Did I just not have enough faith? You know, was there something wrong with me? Did I not have enough faith? Like, like faith, if, if we just have enough of it, then, then we'll be okay. Or if we just believe God hard enough or strong enough. And, and on the other end of the continuum, that can lead to entitlement with God or even using God. You know, uh, believing God for a new truck or believing God for a big screen TV or believing God for a promotion or, or one of these other things. And all of this sort of fits into a religious mindset that says do more and try harder so that you can get more and experience less pain. And that's kind of at the core of religion is a do more, try harder experience of life. But Jesus invited us into a relationship. And in relationships, we can express our feelings. We can experience comfort. We can experience peace. We can experience God's blessing in the midst of our pain and our sorrow. And we see this very clearly throughout the Old Testament that the people of God in the Old Testament, we'll look at, at one Psalm in particular throughout this series, uh, but we also see this very clearly in the New Testament that Jesus said in John 16, 33, a very famous passage, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And he starts that verse by saying, I have told you 
these things that you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. You will have difficulty. Things will go wrong. But take heart, because I have overcome the world. And then in John 20, after he has died for our sins on the cross and he has been put into the tomb and he has resurrected from the tomb, he appears to the disciples and he says to them, after he shows them his hands and his side, as he shows them his hands and his side, he says, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. He's just shown them the, the evidence of his suffering. And he's saying, as the Father sent me, I'm sending you. And we see this throughout Jesus' ministry. These are probably two of the more poignant examples. We see this in Paul's ministry. He spoke frankly about suffering on a number of different occasions. Romans chapter 5 and chapter 8 are some of the clearest. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, there's a whole section on suffering. And though we are hard-pressed, we're not crushed, that we're persecuted, we're not abandoned, we're struck down, we're not destroyed. All of those things are difficult things that would bring suffering and grief and trial into our lives. In Philippians 3, he says, I don't want to know anything other than Christ and the fellowship of His suffering. And so... We don't get a buy on this. We don't get a pass on this just because we're good Christians. And so that sort of sets the table for the psalm I want to look at. We'll look at Psalm 126 uh, today. We'll look at it next week. We'll look at it the following week. If you're one of the kids that like to do extra credit when you were in high school or, or middle school, I want to encourage you to read Psalm 126 every day. I want to encourage you to memorize it over the next two weeks. And I think if you do, You'll get insights from it that you won't get otherwise if you just show up and listen on Sunday. But if you listen and you spend time each day reading this, writing it out maybe, if that's the best way I've found to memorize a psalm is, or a passage of Scripture is to write it out. I would encourage you to do that. If you're joining us online, I would encourage you to set aside that time, put it on your phone, put it on a calendar, that you could do this in five minutes a day. You could memorize the psalm in the next 15 days. I guarantee you can do that. And I think you'd be blessed. And this Psalm 126, it, we're told, is a song of ascents. Scholars aren't 100% sure what that means, that it was a song of ascents uh, or a psalm of ascents. Um, generally tend to agree that it meant you would, you would sing it as you were approaching Jerusalem for worship. So if you were coming from anywhere in the world, anywhere in Jerusalem, or anywhere in Judea, anywhere in the nation of Israel, and you're approaching Jerusalem, you would sing these psalms. They, they would be part of that part of the hymnal that you would pay attention to others, so that literally as you were stepping up the, the temple steps, you would sing songs of of a sense that as you were ascending up but there's always this idea that they draw us into God draw us into his presence and this is a corporate lament and it, it covers a lot of different bases because there's some worship and there's some praise and there's there's a, a request and a prayer and that request takes the form of a lament and so I want to read it to you and then we'll talk about it um, and we'll save a little bit for next week as well But it says this, when the Lord brought back the captives to Zion, we were like men who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. And we are filled with joy. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. He who goes out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with him. Now, there's some interesting things about this psalm. There's no reference to a specific event. Some scholars speculate that this was when they returned from the exile or when a delegation maybe was sent from Assyria or from Babylon during the exile, but there's no indication of that. And the other thing uh, that there's no indication of is any sin or disobedience that caused the fortunes to drift away or any repentance that brought about the restoration. It's, it's almost as if this is very broad and could be very broadly applied to a lot of different circumstances and a lot of different uh, times in Israel's history. 
And that, that phrase in verse 4, restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. The Negev was the arid desert southern region of Israel. And there would be no rain for a long time and all the streams would dry up. And they're basically saying that's how we feel right now. That's how we feel. Their lives feel like a desert despite no wrongdoing on their part. There's no confession of any wrongdoing. There's no confession or, or promise for repentance. They're just saying our fortunes have gone the wrong way in our opinion. <laughs> and you know when rain comes, then all the streams fill. And, and they're basically saying, fill us like those dry riverbeds. And I believe this is why weeping well is so important. Because they didn't do anything wrong in this case. There's no cause and effect. Yes, the Bible talks about reaping and sowing. Even this passage talks about reaping and sowing, but in a different way than most scriptures. When Paul talks about reaping and sowing, he talks about, about sowing to the Spirit so that you can reap life versus sowing to the flesh that you would reap death and destruction. And there are cause and effect relationships between the things that we do and the things that happen to us in many cases. If you're not, faithful, uh, not a faithful steward in your finances, you can expect certain things to take place in your financial life. And if you are faithful, you can expect certain things. That reaping and sowing does hold water. It is a solid biblical principle, but it is not carte blanche. That, that we live in a fallen world where things are not working as God had originally intended. In the garden, everything was perfect all the time. Prior to the fall, there was unbroken fellowship with God. There was no relational dis discontent. There was no anger. There was no fear. There was no suffering. Prior to the fall, everything worked as it was intended to. But we live now in a world that is after the fall, where things don't work the way that they're supposed to. And there are natural disasters, and there is evil, and there is suffering, and there are random tragedies that there is no explanation for. And we live in a world with illness, and with birth defects, and with honest mistakes that have disastrous consequences. And that's why we must learn to weep well, because, because grief and sorrow are unavoidable, but our response to them makes a big, big difference. And so there is a sense in which becoming a person of faith, solid biblical faith, in a relationship with Jesus Christ, there is a sense in which becoming a person of faith may cause you to weep more, not less. Causing you to see the evil and the pain and the suffering in the world and weep more, not less. Ezekiel 36, 26, a famous passage from the Old Testament. God says to the people of Israel, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Which do you think weeps more? A heart of stone or a heart of flesh? I can tell you as a pastor, I weep much more than I did as a non-pastor, before I was a pastor. And as I have progressed and grown in my relationship, things that used to just make me mad, now they make me sad. And there's a burden and a sorrow that I think I enjoyed just being frustrated and angry about more than feeling the weight of that. The reasons that people give for leaving a church grieve me deeply. And you do it long enough, and you hear enough of the reasons that people get bent out of shape and leave a fellowship, it's disheartening. It's saddening. I used to get mad. I don't get mad anymore. I just get sad. I weep more, not less. And maybe you do too. And if you've had an opportunity to go to a foreign country on a mission trip and see the depth of poverty that half the world is living in, it makes you sad. I've seen things in Nicaragua and in China and in Peru that make me sad. There's a depth to it. And so 
there's a very real sense in which becoming a person of faith and feeling the evil and the pain around you more acutely will cause you to weep more and to lament more and to grieve more and to mourn more and to weep more. But also to experience more joy. So don't get too down. We'll talk about that next week. But as we dig into that well of emotions, we develop the ability to empathize and to connect with people in a new way. And that is one of the beautiful things that comes from that. And so our bottom line today is this, as we grow in grace, which points us back to last week when we talked about Peter's great words, but grow in the knowledge and grace of Jesus Christ. As we grow in grace, we should expect to weep more, not less. As we grow in the unmerited favor of God, we should expect to weep more, not less. We should expect to be more aware of the suffering in this world. And the way that I know that this is true is that there was once a perfect human heart. And he was described as a man of sorrows, familiar with suffering. And we're told that, that Jesus wept many times during his ministry. There are specific examples of it. John eleven thirty five. 35, if you're ever looking to start small on a memorizing scripture, John eleven thirty five 35 is the one for you. It's simple. Jesus wept. Two words. You could walk out of here memorizing scripture today. Jesus wept. John eleven thirty five. 35. Two words. Very, very powerful words that God himself in a body come from heaven to earth to be God with us. He wept. He was moved by what he was seeing at the tomb of Lazarus, his friend, and he wept. Meditate on that. Luke 19, 41, we're told that as he approached Jerusalem, Jesus was overcome with emotion and he wept. He said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. The gravity of, of his desire for those people, for the people of God, for the nation of God, caused him to weep. Hebrews 5, 7 tells us that he had loud cries during his ministry, that he was heard because of his obedience, that Jesus cried out to God the Father. He wept, he wailed. And so as we follow him, as we grow in the knowledge of him, as we grow in our relationship with him, as we grow in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we can expect to weep. And we should expect to weep more, not less, as we grow in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And there's also a very practical reason that we should expect our tears. For those of you that like practical applications, if you expect your tears, you will not be disappointed. If you do not expect your tears, you'll have two things to cry about. The thing you're crying about and the fact that you're crying about something, right? If you don't expect tears, you'll always be crying about two things instead of one. And you'll ask yourself really unproductive questions like, why is this happening to me? What did I do? Don't I deserve better? Haven't I been good? And yet the time that I have spent in cultures that do expect pain and suffering they have a joy that is irrepressible in the midst of extreme poverty and difficulties. And they live in little shacks with dirt floors. And in the rainy season, they're mud floors. And they expect it. They expect it to be terrible. And they expect it to be difficult. And they experience a depth of joy in the good that is hard for us to imagine. The things that delight them are hard for us to imagine. In fact, Peter says in 1 Peter 4.12, do not be surprised at the painful trial you're suffering as though something strange were happening to you. Expect difficulties, expect trials, expect sorrow, expect sadness. And he goes on to say that, that you'll be blessed when you do, that God is with you, that God is for you. 
And as I reflected on that, my mind went to the serenity prayer. I know I've talked about the serenity prayer before. Most of you are familiar with the first half. Probably fewer of you are familiar with the second half or the second two-thirds, really. Like, we know the serenity prayer where it says, God, grant me the grace to accept with serenity the things that I can't change. Give me the courage to change the things I should. Key word there, should. Not just can, but should. And give me the wisdom to know the difference. That's the first half. That's the one that's the most familiar. But there was a second part to that when Reinhold Niebuhr wrote this originally. It says, living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace, taking as Jesus did the sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. See, if we don't expect sorrow, if we don't expect suffering, if we don't expect tears, then we're basically saying, God, I expect to be supremely happy in this life, and I'm not going to think much about the next because I'm all focused right here and right now. And yet there is a way as we look to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, and we see how he saw hardship as a pathway to peace. And we took this sinful world as it is, not just as I would have it. We can trust that he'll make all things right if we surrender to his will so that we may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with him forever in the next. There's an opportunity if there is something specific that you are grieving, that you are experiencing sorrow over and having a difficult time, whether that's a specific sense of loss, the loss of a loved one, the loss of, of, of a lifestyle, a loss of whatever the case may be, whatever's causing you to grieve. We have a grief share ministry that meets here at Linwood and just would highly, highly recommend that you make contact with Pastor Sandy, if that is something that is of interest to you or to someone you know, about half of our participants come from outside Linwood. This has become a powerful outreach into the community, reaching people for Christ, giving them a place to belong, and helping them grow through their grief in their faith. So I would highly recommend that to you and commend that to you. It's about a 13-week process. Uh, You can join it at any time, so some people join halfway through and they catch the other half. A lot of people do it two or three times just to learn and to grow. And I would highly recommend that to you if this is touching a specific place in your life and something specific is coming to mind. Because it will help you to tap into the well of God's grace. The well of God's grace that says that, that grief is normal, grief is natural, grief is necessary in order to heal from that experience of loss. And so I would encourage you in that, because as we grow in grace, we should expect to weep more, not less. And as we go through this series, we'll see how that plays out, and we'll see what the results of that is, the results of weeping well. And as you read Psalm 126, you'll get some clues into what that outcome of weeping well really is. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you that you are a good God who loves us. Even in the midst of our difficulties and our trials and our struggles, you are there. You have promised that you would never leave us or forsake us. That you will be present with us in our grief. Help us learn, Lord, to weep well, to expect our tears, to invest our tears, to pray our tears, and to see your joy come in the morning. We love you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. about this job.
Now I'm on. <laughs> Take a moment, process the words that we just sang, because I know I need to process the words that we just sang too. Take a moment and process the notes that you've written down. Whether you're here in this auditorium or you're at home in our living room, thanks for being with us and thanks for being a part of our family of families. When we give, we give with a joyful noise. We give because it's not just something that, as Christians, we're supposed to do. We do it because we believe in the mission field that goes beyond this moment. That Linwood Church does not just exist for the 10 a.m., 10.30 a.m. to the 11.30 a.m. spot. Linwood Church exists beyond because of the mission that we hold so dear. In fact, if you, for those that are here in this room right now, when you walk out these doors, take a look on your left, and you're going to see our core values. And one of our core values talks about this idea of legacy. Linwood is a shining example of passing on from generations to generation this living legacy. And coming up on September 2nd, we are kicking off our student ministry again. And we're going to be having the rising party and we're going to be welcoming our brand new sixth graders into the fold. And yeah, things are going to look a little bit differently. We have a, a whole check-in, temperatures, all those type of things to make sure your students are safe. But the focus I want to bring to our congregation today is that you are a part of this legacy. And that when we give, we give to continue to enrich, establish, and grow our faith into these generations. To give, you can give online. You can put your tithes and offering at the end. You can mail it. Whatever it may be, you're giving to the legacy. Check out the legacy that you have been a part of. Check out this video. There is a hope that drives us. A love that burns in our hearts. A purpose that makes us who we are. As followers of Jesus, grace has changed us, and we can't help but give it away. We carry this message and chase this calling to the farthest and forgotten corners of the kingdom, classrooms and clinics, the neighborhood and the mission field into city streets and out beyond the borders. And everywhere we go, in everyone we meet, we find him already at work and inviting us to join him. Spreading the hope of Jesus in innovative and spirit-inspired ways, we are seeing lives, churches, communities transformed by his extravagant love and limitless grace, ripple effects of redemption around the world. Let us be forever the one 
makes all things new. And we are the living proof of that promise. We are the Wesleyan Church, and we are made new. You should invite somebody you know to come to the rising party. And that's, well, should we go here? Pray for the sound system at Linwood. The last two weeks have just been, like, I mean, that's a little bit of a joke, a little tongue in cheek, um, but for real, pray for the sound system. We don't know what's going on. We've tracked a lot of things down and it seems like other things, it's like a game of whack-a-mole back there. You fix one thing and another one pops up. Uh, but don't lose sight of just, there's some awesome things happening at Linwood on Wednesday nights in the LSM, and Kidsway's going to be kicking off the following week, so, um, so invite somebody to come and uh, be a part of, of what's happening and the excitement that is taking place there. I also want to give mention, uh, if you received the Friday email, you saw that we'll be collecting items for St. Francis House this Sunday and next throughout the week. Uh, there is a table out in front of the world map there in the lobby that you can bring those items. There's handouts there if you want to pick one up. Um, and then we will take those uh, after next Sunday down to St. Francis House. You can also take things directly there um, or support them financially. And those are great ways to be involved in our community. As we prepare to go from this place, I would invite you to stand as I read the benediction. These are the words of Paul to the church at Ephesus. Pre peace to you and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to all you who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. Go carry that love and that faith and that grace into that world. God bless you as you go. Have a phenomenal week. We'll see you soon.